Hello and welcome to episode number 310 of the Armin Show podcast, where it has been growing. We learn more, we understand more about science, creativity. I include a little bit about boldness, reaching out, changing your life a bit as possible, because we have opportunities in this existence. Mm-hmm. On this episode here, we have the author of multiple books, okay? You see books on books, okay? We'll get to those. This author was born in the same city on the planet as I was, which is Tehran in Iran, fabulous item there, and <laughs> departed from there in the same way that I did at some point. And that is the story that is in her book, A Beginner's Guide to America for the Immigrant and the Curious. Roya Hakakian, welcome to the show. Hi, Armin. I'm delighted. We're glad to have you on here, full of delight, colorful, and vibrant. Now, you have written multiple books, you have done poetry, you're creative. Before we get to the content, how would you describe your path getting to where you are right now? Um, it's been bumpy and it continues to be bumpy. Um, what's, what I find every time is that um, I publish a book and it's great. And then I want to publish, I want to go to a publisher for a second book. And it's as if I've never published anything. Who are you? <laughs> so it's always, uh, it's amazing. I, it, it's always starting, um, I, I suppose, from, from the very beginning. Um, I shouldn't say that because, you know, uh, I know how difficult it is for so many writers to land a book contract and actually do get published by, uh, by you know, by real press. Um, mm-hmm. So I can't complain because I've had... Uh, amazing publishers, especially uh, my last one, um, the book which you showed, which is, <laughs> which is a Knopf book. So there's nothing to complain about, except that, um, you know, you, there, there's a certain amount of productivity and, and activity that you need to keep up. And, and if you don't, uh, then, you know, uh, you need to kind of build your way back up, which is uh, what has happened. You know, some of the, some of the distances between my first book and the second book and the second book and the third book have been um, a bit longer than what they should have been. Momentum. I have talked about momentum many a times. We yeah. who are creators or do things, we don't want to let the momentum slip because we're putting ourselves in a space where things are made, things are going out, we're doing, we're glad to be there. If that yeah. slips, we're, in, we're basically in somebody else's home at that point where we're not making, we're not doing, we're not putting it out. And then we'll have these gaps like you're describing that don't make sense to us later. Like, why was that gap there? There was opportunity. Right. Momentum is a big deal. So staying prolific is nice. And you have stayed prolific of sorts. Publishers yeah. and behind the scenes stuff, nobody sees that kind of thing. But it's the process. Nobody sees any of the behind the scenes. That's why there's so few people that make great things or do a lot. Because mm-hmm. if all those things were so light natured, everybody would just casually, I have a book. I have a thing. I have a... <laughs> That's not how it works. Now, Let's go into this book here and your background as far as getting to the United States. Can you tell us about your departure from there to here? And then later on, maybe I'll include some of mine as well. Sure, Um, I'd love to hear your story. Um, This book that that you are referring to um, isn't so much a memoir. So so it's 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 a mix, it's a salad, I call it. Um, I decided that um, it can be anything I want. So, so it was um, a little bit of memoir and um, a little bit of you know, fictionalized accounts here and there, which I can point to. Um, there are dialogues that I make up, um, which, and those are the parts that I'm calling fictionalized. And then there are, there are actually eyewitness accounts and testimonies and and memoirs of other immigrants and refugees that I have incorporated. So it's a, it's, a, it's a salad of sorts. However, my first book, which you don't have at your disposal. Uh, You're right, I do not have Journey from the Land of No. Journey from I do not. Land of no is, is actually the story of uh, the Iranian revolution in 1979 and how uh, you know, I, as a little girl, kind of was coming at eight, uh, of age uh, during those tumultuous years, um, what I saw, um, you know, because I thought, it, why should just the politicians and, you know, the 
important people get to say what they saw. I, I was a kid um, or I was a preteen and then a teen uh, when it all went down. And, and um, you know, I'd like to share my perspective too. Voice. Yeah, exactly. So, so that was the first book and the story of what happened to Iran. Both are, you know, uh, birth countries. And, um, and then um, how it affected um, me as a girl, women uh, at large, and then the Jewish community and secular Iranians. And, and those were really the three groups that I was most interested in telling the story of. And that was because, you know, when I came here and that may be the, your own experience too, you know, we said Iran and everybody um, immediately thought, you know, devout Shiite person, you know, with, and, and there was nothing in between. There was not Jew, you know, there are no Jews in Iran. Like there were Jews in Iran before there were Muslims in Iran. And, and you know, secular Iranians, no, 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 no. You know, secular Iranians don't exist. So, so I, I thought my job was to tell the story of, of those people whose voices or the record of their existence somehow um, didn't exist, and and that's that was the memoir. And then uh, it, it sort of ends. I have heard from many people uh, at a at a, a climactic moment, which is when my father says it's time for us to leave Iran. But then I don't tell the story of the departure, which is um, what many readers have said. So then what? And and I haven't told that segment yet. That's unbelievable. Okay. You're leaving so people me. like this. Well, what was your uh, departure story? Well, I don't recall any of it because it was, let's say, two months into my existence. And then we <laughs> headed over to the land of Germany. And then we were there for about a year and a half or something, a year and 10 months. And then we came here. So I'm two when I get here. So as far as the recollection, real limited. I'm about a month, two months old. But definitely great culture there. I like the architecture. I'm kidding. I don't remember anything. But... It was a definite process there. It, it was not like a casual, you know, relocation to a new land for yeah. my familial entities. And there's a lot of heft to it at that time. Now it looks more like a story, but I'm sure at that time it was more like a risky endeavor of sorts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you describe your departure as a risky endeavor or more of oh, a my. casual oh. relocation? Uh risk uh, maybe it was risky for my dad more than it was risky for my mother uh, and me uh, who lived who left Iran together my father was smuggled into Pakistan uh, on the back of a you know donkey truck or handcart or whatever so so his was uh, you know far more adventurous and dangerous um, ours wasn't so much, but then, you know, uh, it was certainly uh, eventful um, and tragic and dramatic. Um, and, and, you know, you, you don't remember, but <clears throat> the period that you were in Germany, I was in Austria next door. And, um, and that I was there with my mom and a group of <clears throat> other women who were applying for to become refugees in the United States. And so, you know, we were all, you know, 12 people cooped up in a two bedroom apartment and um, for, for about a year, which is uh, the time it took for our uh, asylum applications to the United States to be approved. So, um, so yeah, um, tumultuous times. I like that you bring up, well, <laughs> earlier you brought up how there's no there can be this kind of person from Iran or Iran or other types of people. There's no nuance. And I feel like we fill in the gaps for what's missing. So there's no nuance. You bring all the nuance. There's no people telling the story at that time because it's tumultuous. You're telling the story about that time because it's not as tumultuous. And now it's time to express. Do you ever feel like we as people fill in the gaps that other moments did not allow for? Um, exactly. I mean, I... I have always, um, from, from the very beginning, that I started to write in English, not in Persian, because in Persian I was writing poetry and it was a whole different you know, endeavor. But as soon as I started to write in English, I saw myself as the person 
whose responsibility in some ways uh, or commitment or, uh, or I drew inspiration from finding the stories that could vanish if I didn't tell them. So I thought, I thought my job wasn't to talk about you know, the nuclear negotiations because everybody else in the world was talking about the nuclear negotiations. Right. I thought my job wasn't to explain, you know, what is the difference between this cleric and that cleric in Iran because everybody else is talking about that. And I thought I should, not that I should, but I was drawn to the stories that I thought could disappear uh, or be wiped away from the record if I didn't bear witness to them. And that's what I've done from the beginning till now. I like that you were drawn to them. It yeah. was your interest. It was connected with your passion versus like, you should do this. This is what people do. <laughs> it's a different dynamic. Now, in the book, your perspective, I noticed, is not of like, I did this and then I did that. There's a perspective that you noticed what was happening. Why did you choose that perspective versus like, I went to here and then I caused this to occur and then I did this and the United States was like, there's a perspective there. There's a, I tell the whole book uh, or I tell the whole, the voice of that book um, <clears throat> was all in second person. So I'm, I'm addressing uh, the reader um, as if I, you know, I'm instructing them. Um, it, it's, it was a, a definitely an artistic choice because I, thought, and this is, this is where it all began, the idea of this book. In 2016, when, when we were hearing all this, you know, anti-immigrant rhetoric, um, and, you know, immigrants are here to take our jobs and immigrants are, you know, um, come here to, you know, rape and do this or, you know, commit crimes and stuff. I really was startled. And, and I thought, what? You know, even though uh, in some ways it was so long ago that I had been a new, a new immigrant, it, it should have been really none of my business because I've been a naturalized citizen for a long time. I could have easily said, this isn't my issue. But, but then I couldn't also help um, think that if I don't defend, uh, you know, my brethren, if I don't defend the immigrant, or if I, rather than defend, let's say, if I don't explain the immigrant and what the immigrant feels like upon arriving in America, who will? Because, um, you know, because everybody was talking on behalf of the immigrant, right? There were politicians, you know, pro and con, you know, pro-immigrant, anti-immigrant on both sides. Um, who were speaking on behalf of the immigrant, then there were a whole bunch of journalists who rightly were reporting on the immigrant. And I thought, wait, you know, the immigrant should say something too. And so I thought, here I am. I am a naturalized citizen. So I can both speak on behalf of the immigrant and to the, to the new immigrant. And in the process, hopefully, in pretending to have this conversation with, with the newcomer. Maybe some, some of the native born Americans who I want to reach will eavesdrop, so to speak, on this conversation and then take something away, right? You know, hear something that they may not hear elsewhere. And, and that's really in some ways the, the sort of feedback that I keep getting that, um, you know, people who've been born and raised in this country have, you know, post on Amazon and on review boards um, that they are seeing America as if for the first time by reading this book. And that's precisely what I wanted to happen. I, I wanted people to see what we see. I, want, I wanted people to experience what we experience. And I thought that would be a disarming, would have a disarming influence that, that people who knew how we uh, you know, react um, upon arriving here would would somehow get very close to us and therefore be less afraid of us, if that makes sense. 
It does make sense. Does it come from a place of empathy or more like being informational? I think um, I think it comes from a place of empathy. It comes from a place of sympathy. And I think in the process of imparting both of those emotions, then it's it's also informational. It has to be because you know you once you uh, you know impart that sense to somebody, um, it's not just a feeling. It comes with a series of um, uh, knowledge that you didn't have before. So it it naturally becomes informational too. Yeah, this one's a classic. I know countries like Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan, but where is self-esteem and what's that about? Oh. That was inside the novel of sorts. Where can I find self-esteem? Self-esteem. Self-esteem was, was what I thought in some ways America can be described as, right? You know, I remember, <clears throat> well, you you were, you know, wee bit when, <laughs> uh, when you were in Iran, so you don't know this, but the first time I published a book of poetry, tiny, tiny little book. Um, and it was all obviously in Persian. Um, a critic who I really, really liked and whose views I so very much admired um, uh, called me up to congratulate me, to say that she really liked the book. And I was That's ecstatic. The best was, I was just so happy. And I was really, really young. I was in my early twenties. So to think that I had you know, published a little book and, and the very critic who I really admired uh, had picked up the phone to call me to tell me that she liked the book. It was a big deal. But she, she said something amazing. What did she, she say? Said, she said, uh, it's a beautiful book. You're great. You will have a great future, blah, blah, blah. Everything that I wanted to hear. But there are too many eyes in your book. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, you know, we are Iranians. You know, we can't be so, we can't sound so selfish and so self-centered. So you should work on, you know, eliminating all these eyes and take the, you know, the emphasis off of yourself. Now, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking, one, I'm thinking, I don't know what to think of this. You know, because what kind of advice is that? You they got know? all the eyes, just take them out. <laughs> you know, and then secondly, I was thinking, eh, but I'm a poet. That's what we do. We we put ourselves in the way of experiences to know, to try to tell the rest of the world what it feels like. And mm -hmm. how could I possibly wipe that away? And then imagine that's where we come from, right? That's that's the culture that we come from. And then you arrive here in, in America, where I, as I say in the book, is king. You know, we, we are told that we have rights. We are told that we're important. We're told that, you know, our opinions matter and, and that we should express them. And, and so that, the, you know, it, it wasn't so much a clash of races or or, you know, I don't know, religions, as it was a clash of two vastly different views of who I am vis-a-vis -vis everybody else. And, and whether I matter or, or can express myself or not. And therefore, I thought I had gone from the, the land of no, which is how I refer to Iran in my first book, you know, it's called Journey from the Land of No, the country that denied me and the other girls everything, to Selfistan, the country that said the self is everything. So I thought, you know, uh, this is, it was, it was in some ways the proper way of referring to this country and to my experience as someone who had come from a place like that. This is a big one. I think of it like collectivist versus individualist nations. Europe is also kind of collectivist. Would you say that what, however someone grew up until let's say age 15 or 20 is a big factor in which view they'll be more fitting with probably for their whole existence? Um, I don't, I, I do think 
that, you know, certain experiences shape us um, early on in irreversible ways. But I don't, I also don't want to ever believe um, that we can change uh, the way we think about the world, you know, after the age of, you know, 15 or 16. I, I'd like to believe that it's always possible to add to, um, to who we are and what we think and how how we are but at the same time yes you know there are there are ways in which um i uh, sometimes describe how it is that i write as as a process of going back to the age of 14 and then looking at the world uh once again uh you know through that perspective mainly not because i want to lose the knowledge that i have now but because there was something about um, about that time. There was something about being fourteen and fifteen, and being able to kind of uh, uh, do away with so much of other uh, layers of consciousness or anxiety that that get in the way um, that didn't exist uh, for me back then, and I. Um, I saw what I saw, I, I knew what I was seeing, and I had, I felt very strongly about everything, and of course, you know, uh, adolescents do, but there was something uh, pure and, and, you know, urgent about all of that, which I uh, always try to find my way back to as a writer. We'll call the kids see things and they're like that's a that this is that somebody looks at them in a certain way they're like i don't like that person 12 years later they're like that's why i didn't like them and they find out but you can tell from these little items but then later on in life those same things you're not as cognizant of you're like i have to worry about this thing instead and then you're not as the bandwidth is dropped in in most ways yeah. i like high bandwidth interactions in life I always think about uh, video is highest bandwidth then audio is lower than text and like the lowest bandwidth one book said is a like on social media because it's just a one bit click like <laughs> it doesn't really say much that's funny yeah that's the experience of it uh would you say that you resonate now more with the way of this region or it is something that you're compelled towards the like we as a group and thinking for like a group of people to this day um i um there is definitely um you know uh, a a mix of both um world perspectives uh, mm -hmm. that have um you know intertwined in, mm -hmm. in within me and I can't really separate. I can't say right. um, this is what, uh, what I was, you know, 30 years ago or, um, or this is, you know, the Iranian aspect of me and this is the American aspect of me. I think, I think they're both really intertwined in, in and, and in certain ways, it's a very, very wonderful thing because uh, a lot of times I feel like um, I'm an interlocutor um, because I can. One of the best words out there. Yes, yes. So, so I, I, do you feel can that? You tell, I... Can you tell our listeners what an interlocutor is? Oh, oh, um, an intermediary. Uh, uh, you know, someone who interprets one side for for the other. Mm -hmm. um, I go, I go from. You know, sometimes I feel like you know I'm standing on a bridge um, between these two peoples or cultures. And my job is to tell, you know, this side what the others are saying, and and bring it, bring the news back. And I uh, oftentimes feel like that's what I do in writing. I I am I'm taking messages back and forth um, through my own observations. Uh, I'm trying to explain both sides to the other in ways that um, it may be inaccessible to them because. Um, because they have heard about the other side through people who were firmly standing on just one side. Um, and I feel that I belong truly uh, to both and I'm rooted truly in both. And therefore, you know, I have, I have a better access um, to either side. Mm -hmm. 
I noticed that poetry has a warmth to it, connectivity, and it's relatable. Same with stories with people and actors in them that are characters, as opposed to if it was just in like an encyclopedia or almanac that's informative, but it's not relatable. Why the poetry in the first place? How did you jump to that? You didn't have to be creative. Where did that come from? You know, um, I always try to uh, say to people who ask me that question, you know, why did you start writing poetry? Um, that, you know, for the same reason that every American kid um, signs up for, uh, you know, Little League and baseball training, right? You know, this is what we did in Iran. It was our equivalent of Little League, we, we all wrote, we all wrote poetry and we, we were supposed to, we were supposed to, you know, kind of react to the world, um, either by borrowing from older poets, other poets, or by creating. And, and so, or, or at least that's how I, I understood us to be at the time that I was in Iran. And, and certainly the fact that my father was always in a corner when he was at home. He was always in a corner with a notebook. Um, and, and he didn't even have a desk. He didn't even sat on a desk. He was, he was kind of uh, crouching um, on the floor where we all you know, sat. And he would pull the notebook against his knees and he would scribble things. And you know, it was always poetry. So we went to weddings and my father would be invited to, to recite whatever it was he had composed about the bride and groom, whom oftentimes he didn't know from Adam, but you know, <laughs> he would compose something about them anyway. Um, or, you know, or other occasions like this, but, but that's, that's how I, I kind of uh, experienced myself as his daughter and as, as sort of uh, belonging to, to that tradition. I like that example because that doesn't seem so difficult to do versus a person who's like, I need the perfect table. I need my exact laptop and it needs to be like this. I need the lighting like this and the music like this before I can create. And then they'll just sit there at a blank page. And then he's over there in the corner, no table, no there's a paper. I'm going to, if you have it, you have it. And then the limitations are not really there. If it's not really in you and you put 15 other things or you're going to be a runner and you get running shoes and you get 15 things, but you don't actually go and do it. It's not the main the main thing has to be there it's a good example mm -hmm. Lim limitation is good by the way actually i want to go to that how has limitation served you in your existence to focus you in some way has it done that that's interesting mm -hmm. uh i think so i i think um you know i i wanted a piano so badly as a child i so how badly so though because we just don't know what how badly though? We just can't tell. <laughs> so badly that I used to sit at breakfast with a uh, knife and fork. And I used to imagine that there was a keyboard in front of me. And, and I was stupid enough. Not stupid. To, I'm not agreeing with that. <laughs> to think that if only I had the real keyboard, then this is how I had to press, you know, with my work a knife, uh, the, the keys in order to, uh, you know, bring out whatever sound it was or uh, tune that I was listening to. So I was, I was certain that, that I was pressing the right imaginary keys uh, if only I had the real thing in front of me. And that's, that's what I was doing, in, you, know, in, you know, at breakfast, at, at meals. Um, and, and there was a boy when I was 14 <laughs> who was not terribly attractive and who certainly wasn't very sociable, but he was a great, great uh, pianist. And I used to follow him to his piano lessons. Uh, so he would go to his piano lesson. I would go into the room and sit in the corner and just listen. What and that, it, it, so I'm saying all this because uh, I wanted a piano, we couldn't afford one. So I found a boy who <laughs> could have afforded, or had afforded a piano, and I just followed him from one lesson to the next. And so I think, you know, this is a long way of, um, roundabout way of saying that 
Um, You're like roundabout here, by the way. <laughs> you know, because I I didn't have a piano because you know all the other fancy things weren't accessible to me, especially after um, you know the rise of the revolutionary government in Iran, where you know women couldn't do X, Y, and Z, and you know there were no theater and there were, you know, you couldn't do, you know, so many sports were shut down on, especially on women and much of it on the rest of the country too. And music was banned uh, in those early years. I just had writing and, and I think in some ways, um, yes, you know, it focused me. You know, out of curiosity, did you return to piano in some form or did you leave that on the side? No, I just it decided it was so by the time um, I did have a piano in my home. I thought, you know, it's just too late, you know, um, but why not? I mean, we could all try, right? Yes. I like pianos. It's actually my favorite instrument of all, and I play a little bit, but that's kind of cool that we have an image. There's things when I was young, I thought I was doing that thing accurately for what it would be in my small version, because <laughs> I guess our imagination doesn't make it so that we're playing, but it's playing wrong like it would be on an actual thing or uh, like race cars. We're going full speed and everything is at the idealization level. And then later on, practicality hits and then we have to progress through it. Kind of a transition. That's kind of cool. I noticed themes. I'm very uh, theme oriented in individuals. But before I say that, what are some words you would use to describe yourself? Let's say three words that you identify with or that you would use to describe yourself? Mm. Um, it's always a challenge one, this one. It's not a challenge for me because I've thought about it for years, but when I throw it out there, it's always like a, yeah. I think um, I am introspective. I, yeah. um, I think I am creative. Um, and I think I am curious. Um, that's fortunately, uh, a quality that I have not lost. So you can always uh, show me as my sons now do, introduce me to something new and I won't say, oh no, rap is not for me, you know. <laughs> uh, I'm a rock person, but no, they, they you know, bring things to me and, and I, uh, I do like, um, to enter their world and I do like to know what it is that intrigues them and excites them so I'm happy that I remain curious you have a warmth we are short of in 2021 in general now I would like to transition also and include assassins of the turquoise palace turquoise is one of my favorite colors cyan aquamarine I told that to people for years for no reason almost but how is this part of the story and it also is informational in some forms, but why is this book the second of your series of books? Well, you know, the first book was the story of <clears throat> the Iranian revolution and what I saw as a, as a kid in Iran, as a little girl. Um, that book is the story of, um, you know, uh, the diaspora, the Iranian diaspora in Europe. And then <clears throat> the third book brings us to the United States. So, I mean, I didn't conceive them as three books that belong together, but eventually now that they're done, I feel like in some ways they're a trilogy, you know, because, you know, we are in Iran, then we are in transit and then we arrive. Um, so that, that book um, tells the story, one particular story about, um, you know, um, an assassination at a restaurant against the group of uh, Iranian dissidents who were having dinner together. And, and then, you know, what it took for the um, German justice system to, to uh, prosecute these assassins and, um, and deliver justice. It, it, was a, it was a really wonderful story. And I learned a great deal um, about so much in the process about, um, about Germany, about um, how the German justice system uh, is different from our justice system here in the United States. Um, and, and, um, and, and also about, you know, how, uh, how 
a mere delivery of justice to uh, a group of disadvantaged people whom in that particular book are Iranian refugees in Europe um, can uh, create a, a path or can pave the way for them to feel belonging in these other countries where they've come to. That I think in some ways um, that the happy or just ending to that um, trial caused so many of uh, the refugees within the Iranian community to come to believe in, in the German justice system. And as a result of it, to feel that they could belong in, in Germany as, uh, as real citizens because uh, they saw that it would be fair to them. And, and so I, um, I use that entire story to, to tell many other, uh, make any, many other points, but that certainly is one of them. Hmm. As you have written your books, have there been any people who were notable to you or you were kind of modeling after their writing or maybe even poets, but are there any figures that you've looked to for many years for inspiration or some sort of blueprint? Um, certainly. I mean, I can't remember who it was at, you know, at the time that I was reading, uh, writing this one or the other one. But, but yes, you know, I, I actually <clears throat> get, get very close to certain writers um, uh, while I'm looking for a particular uh, sensibility or voice or uh, mood. And, and then I read and read and read until I sort of exhaust um, that, that, um, that writer. And then I move on to someone else for, for a while. Um, you know, I, I was looking at Twitter today and someone was, uh, had listed his favorite uh, books of fiction. And I immediately added um, a few of mine. And one of them was um, The Testament of Mary, for instance, by um, Colm Tobin, um, one of, it's one of my all time favorite books, uh, which is uh, incidentally, it's, um, you know, the, the voice of, uh, the mother of Jesus, Mary, who is telling her own account of what it was like to uh, lose her son, what she saw. And, and uh, that was actually one of the inspirations uh, behind this third book about, you know, the immigrant arriving in America, you know, the, uh, that, that, that very strong voice uh, of someone who had experienced, experienced something very deeply um, uh, who wanted to tell others about it uh, was echoing in my head, certainly, when, at least when I decided to uh, write this book, this new one. One of the greatest things we do in life is have our hefty passion within us and then express it to others. For some, that's their greatest uh, moments of their days. Oh, passion was passed on and I get the feeling of someone who likes something because there's so few, let's say, who really are into what they're saying or what they're doing. Those few people, I think, energize basically everybody else and through their time. So it's a very important cause for anyone who has a lot of momentum or prolific natures to pass that on in some form. If you had, this one's a good one because I like to check sometimes, if you had a message to all people of the planet, what would you want them to know about either your writing or just the message you'd tell to them? And if possible, could you do that in English and Persian for variation purposes? Wait, 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 wait. What was that last part? Oh, if, could you, that message, could you include uh, a, an element of it in English and then maybe add a Persian translation of it? Oh, after? oh That'd be cool. I can. So, you know, ever since COVID hit, uh, we keep hearing that um, uh, nobody's safe until, unless we are all safe, right? Um, and I really like that. I really like the thought that, um, you know, we all have to mask up or we all have to get vaccinated because if we don't, then nobody can really be uh, worry-free, right? But I, what I don't like or what I would like people to uh, do is to extend this idea to everything else too, that, that in some ways, um, 
that none of us can truly enjoy our own democracy unless everybody else has a democracy too, because, because their absence of democracy will affect us one way or another. Their absence of freedom will affect us one way or another eventually. So I'd like to, I love this, this COVID experience in, in the way that it showed us that we are in it together, all of us. And, and I just want us to take the next logical step, which is that it applies to everything else uh, about us. It, you know, we, we're in this together politically, socially, democratically, and, and um, um, which, which in Persian, uh, the first one of our great poets said, Bani Adam Azai Yekdigaran, Kedar Alfarinesh Yekdigaran, which is to say, um, people, you know, human beings are all part of each other. And um, they were all uh, the same at the time of Genesis. And that's how they were born. So, in, in some ways, it, it tells us that we are interconnected. And, and that's, um, that's what I think is wonderful to, to impart on others. <laughs> An interconnectedness of sorts. A yeah. couple of things you had mentioned that remind me of a similar view from um, an ethicist I had talked to. So there's ethics involved in what you're saying too, which is a nice feature of sorts. This is wonderful. In constraints of time, which I value, and it's important to value, and I tell people this, if you value your time highly, other people will value your time highly. And also you'll be around more people who value their time highly and will also value your time highly. It's like a shared thing. So. Shall we go? Uh, we shall go. But before we do, I want to mention to all the people, Assassins of the Turquoise Palace, A Beginner's Guide to America, Roy Hakakian, poet, Persian, from the same country as me. I would like to thank you for having been on episode 310 of the show. I loved it. Thank you. I like it too. And we are out.